Okay, we are now in session 22, and we're going to look at chapter 20, which is this amazing vision of the millennium that was given to John. Now, before we even get into that, uh, there are three main camps of thought, uh, which directly influence interpretation of chapter 20. And so these three main schools of thought are premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, premillennialism, but even before I say that, um, when I uh, studied all three versions, I will have to admit that I did not see a grand slam winner in all in any of these. However, because uh, because there's some strong arguments in all three camps. However, uh, I do lean towards pre-millennialism, and that is basically how we're going to teach uh, chapter 20. So now, having said that, let's explain what each camp is all about. Uh, the premillennialists, they're also known as restorationalists, they interpret scripture literally, which is Definitely, um, I'm a strong believer of. We take scripture at face value. Although there's some obvious segments that are obviously figurative or allegorical. I mean, for example, uh, uh, the woman being Israel. Uh, we know it's not a woman in the sky. It's talking about Israel. Uh, of uh, Revelation chapter 12. That's just as a simple example. Anyway, premillennialists, they believe that all the prophecies in the Bible that concerns the coming kingdom of God will literally be established. If it says it's going to be established, it will be established on earth after Jesus Christ returns. All right. Premillennialists are futurists, meaning that most events uh, that's in Scripture of, of the thousand years of the millennial reign of God's uh, coming kingdom, it's not happened yet. But everything kind of falls in three broad categories. There's those that precede the coming of Christ, those prophecies. There are those that pertain to Jesus' actual return, so all the events going on with the parousia. And then the third is during Jesus' rule and reign for a thousand years on earth. Okay, and then I might add a fourth one, and that is, in one sense, there's two different kingdoms. There's the millennial kingdom, and then after the millennial kingdom, then comes the eternal kingdom of God. And sometimes it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, what uh, some of the Old Testament prophets are referring to. Nevertheless, uh, premillennialists believe in restorationism. And so, in other words, uh, the promises, the covenants, uh, that uh, were made to Israel or the children of Israel are yet to be uh, fulfilled. There will be a restoration of these promises. In fact, there will be a restoration of like uh, how earth started with the Garden of Eden and with God the Father coming down in the evening uh, to uh, visit with his people. Uh, Premillennialists also believe, and this is very important, the mystery the mystery that is found in Christ. And what's that mystery? And that is in Christ, the Gentiles that believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, the Gentile part of the church are now citizens of Israel. And they, as citizens, have all the rights of citizenship. And they now are included and all of God's promises that were made to Israel. So, in other words, the, God's, the promises that God made to the uh, Jewish people, um, in addition to the Jewish people, and ultimately it's the Jewish people that accept Yeshua as the Messiah, in addition, we now throw in the Gentiles, uh, which is the wild olive shoot that is grafted in to the domestic olive tree of Israel. Now let's go to amillennialism because this is also, there's some really, really heavy hitters uh, in the amillennialist camp. 
uh, probably the, the biggest would be uh, G.K. Beale that um, basically has the most uh, 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 the, the most important commentary on um, Revelation. Anyway, I'm a linealist. They, they interpret Scripture mainly allegorically or spiritually, uh, not literally. And so they believe that uh, this is so much... Uh, of of a of a vision of like a dream and the and it's like nothing really uh, means what it says. It has to be looked at uh, through spiritual lens to interpret. They reject the fact that upon Jesus' return there will be a literal thousand year period with Jesus Christ ruling all the nations from Jerusalem, and they believe very firmly that because Israel rejected Jesus. The Jewish people uh, have been rejected by God now and been replaced by the church. So the promises of, of God to his people, uh, well, the Old Testament was uh, uh, the Jewish nation, the, the, uh, Israel. The New Testament has, has taken the church and replaced it. So this is... Um, they're saying that the church is now God's chosen people. This is supersessionism or replacement theology. You've probably heard those terms before. Uh, those, are, uh, uh, those are theories that I strongly disagree with. They believe that the church is now the inheritor of all of God's promises. Okay, I can agree with that and blessings that were formerly given to Israel. So Israel's been taken out. That I cannot agree with. Uh, the millennium is the church age, and the thousand years is just symbolic. It's not literal. So the millennium, from their point of view, is the entire period between the first and second advents, or the first and second coming of Christ. So after the cross, until the, the Battle of Armageddon, this is the church age, and uh, the church um, is, uh, is going to usher in the kingdom of God. Uh, many also interpret that this same time frame is the time frame of the Great Tribulation, which is kind of interesting. But they do believe that the coming kingdom of God is going to no way be a Jewish kingdom. It's going to be strictly a, uh, a church kingdom kingdom with no emphasis on any ethnic group. Augustine, Calvin, Luther, these are uh, probably some of the more uh, recognized amillennialists out there. John Wesley is kind of a, a different, uh, uh, had a different belief. He believed that there were two millenniums, that there was going to be one on earth, and there was also going to be a millennium in heaven. Um, which is also interesting, and I would have to admit there are some scriptures that you would uh, cause one to think that. Then you got the postmillennialists, and these they, basically they take amillennialism and they take a more optimistic viewpoint of the role that the church plays um, in the millennium. Yes, they definitely strongly believe the millennium is the church age. And they definitely believe because Israel rejected Jesus, it was uh, God replaced the Jewish people with the church. And it's the church that is now growing and getting stronger spiritually. Uh, and they're moving now beyond persecution to actually taking victory over uh, the forces of evil. And the church um, is progressively conquering and Christianizing the world. And then when they have witnessed to the whole world and the whole world has been evangelized and, and now we got all these Christians, then Jesus Christ will come and take the kingdom from the church because the church will hand over the kingdom to the Messiah. Now, Interesting enough, most 19th century American evangelicals here in the United States were post-millennial. 
Uh, and the interesting point is, is because they believe this, they went on massive mission campaigns and massive citywide revivals, massive efforts of bringing in thousands and thousands into the church. Um, so you, one would have to stop and, and at least ponder because of what they believe, look at what they accomplished for God's kingdom. Um, but nevertheless, that does not make the theology right. Okay, now with that as an introduction, let's now look at Revelation chapter 20. Ah, before we get there, let me just say this. Because as I have gone through the parts, the bits that I disagree with, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there are some very God-fearing, God-loving, strong uh, Christians that know Scripture inside and out, uh, that believe in amillennialism or postmillennialism. But the questions that I would have to them would be this. If Israel no longer matters to God, then why does it matter to Satan? Why is it going to matter to the Antichrist? Why are, is Satan's hatred fervently against Israel, fervently against the Jewish people? Why is it that it's the Antichrist is going to be raised up to make war against Israel? Why do all the prophesized wars and battles, in the, especially the Old Testament prophets, take place in and around Israel and Jerusalem? What would be the point? What's the point of the Antichrist even setting up the abomination of desolation in the temple's holy place and stopping the temple sacrifices? If the Jewish people were no longer God's chosen, he would go after the church, right? If we're going to set up abomination desolation, it won't be in the temple. It'll be in the church. What's the point of Jacob's trouble? What's, why did God invest so much of his time in cultivating and refining the Jewish people? What's the point of the sealing of the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel with the name of the Father and the Son that was sealed on their foreheads? And then, oh, by the way, why is the Messiah a Jew. He's a lion from the tribe of Judah. Okay? So, nevertheless, uh, that's just uh, where the three camps are, and that does determine a lot of the interpretation that is out there. So I'm pretty much going to stick with the pre-millennial interpretation. And with that, let's go to Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, shut it, and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. So Satan is bound for a thousand years. Uh, the prince of this world is no longer the prince of this world. All of his, his efforts of... Uh, uh, controlling people's minds and ideology and, and teachings, uh, uh, that is going to go away, that influence. Um, so he's not going to be the deceiver. He's not going to be the liar that's out there. And hopefully people will start waking up. Now stop and think about it. Ever since Adam and Eve, our world, mankind, has never experienced living in a world, living a life without Satan's evil influence. What would that do? What would that do to our mindset? What would that do to our practices? What would that start to do with our beliefs? Okay? And it's a very important part of God's plan. Now, I'm just going to mention a couple of tidbits of church history because I, I firmly believe that church history uh, should not be taught as a reason why to believe something. It should be Scripture interpreting Scripture. But nevertheless, the early church, and when I say the early church, uh, the pre-Augustine church, and he was around 350 to 430 A.D., 
believed almost universally that a historical time of peace is going to follow after the defeat of the Antichrist and the resurrection of the saints. And that time of peace will happen before the judgment of mankind and the creation of the new heaven and earth. Now, when Augustine came along, he started a new movement that the millennium is the church age. So that's kind of like the founder of amillennialism and that the church would reign, establish peace, and ultimately judge the world uh, at the end of days, or at least uh, during the church age. Okay, so verse 3 says, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, right? Until the thousand years were ended. Okay, the point I wanted to hone in on here is that the word nations. The nations are still around. The nations are not destroyed. Um, only Satan has been removed, and obviously a lot of heads of states have been removed. Um, therefore, the millennium, what is it? It's not yet Jesus Christ ruling a world of believers. So what is the millennium? What is his rule? What is his government? Um, I think the best way to describe his government is that it's going to be political and it's going to be spiritual. A political and a spiritual government that will have um, uh, in the design, in the plan, over a thousand years to be a final period of testing and trial for mankind. Uh, here's a couple of prophecies that might help understand that. In Zechariah 14, verse 16, starts off and, and it says, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. So there's going to be lots of survivors. Uh, not necessarily Christians, but most likely they all, none of them took the mark of the beast. All right? Or worship the beast. But anyway, they shall be instructed to go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt next door does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain, and there shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. And this shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. Interesting. Okay. We also, it's always important to go back and see what Daniel uh, saw and reported. And Daniel reported in uh, chapter 7, verse 13, where he saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. So that's the Messiah. And he came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him, the Messiah, the Lamb, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So this is the, the political and spiritual government that's being established. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And with the Satan being taken away, um, there should be no reason why man would not connect the dots and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior. Um, but as we know, that's not the case. Okay, now let's go to verse 4. Because verse 4 is a challenge, to say the least. And um, I'd have to say I lost some time trying to figure all this out. So let's read it. Then I saw thrones. And seated on them were those to whom the authority was committed. So we see John sees thrones 
And seated on those are those who have authority the judges committed. Okay, uh, these should be the saints, right? Well, then he says, also I saw, and so that would be in addition to, that would be my guess, the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. So he sees the souls. That's, that's taking us back to the fifth, breaking the fifth seal, because what did John see? He saw the souls, not people. So it was disembodied saints uh, of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And then it says, and those who had not worshipped the beast. So this is a, like another group of people or its image and, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, okay, so we got these martyrs. And those who have not taken uh, the mark of the beast. Um, so we could assume that they're the ones seated on the thrones or are they in addition. So keep that thought. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so they came to life. That almost makes sense because it's souls. So uh, coming to life would be like a physical resurrection and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then it says, the rest of the dead did not come in life until the thousand years were ended. Okay, after the thousand years, that's the second resurrection, right? No, this is the first resurrection. And blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death, not to be confused with resurrection, has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, that almost seems to contradict itself because we're saying after the thousand years, um, and now we got the, they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So anyway, nevertheless, uh, the NIV and King James Version gives a different translation uh, that only those who had been beheaded are really part of the first resurrection, are those that are seated on the throne uh, uh, as judges. Um, and it's not a simple uh, translation error as it is in the Greek. There's a change of grammar, and the deeper I dug into it, uh, the more theologians and those that were Greek scholars were scratching their heads saying, I'm, we're not quite sure how this could be translated. It could be translated one way or the other. Okay, so let's look at the other. Uh, this would be the NIV. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Okay, that's very clear. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. Okay, that's clear. And then it says, they had not. Well, who's the they? Uh, the they, most likely, in that translation, refers to those who have been beheaded, the martyrs. They had not, or the King James says, and which had not, which even makes it more of a stronger argument that it's referring to the beheaded. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. And then it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So basically what they're saying, it's only the martyrs that came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But um, even that is not a very um, strong um, home run um, message behind this this first so what i'm going to do is i did a lot of research and i'm going to start with the argument that supports the niv and king james translation so in other words this is the argument supporting that it's not uh it's only those that have been beheaded that are 
there to be as judges. So Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, and this is going all the way back to the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls, which was referred to here in Revelation 20, I saw the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. In Revelation 20, it would be those who had been beheaded for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Okay. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? And what was God's answer? They were given a white robe. They were told to rest a little longer. And then listen to this. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. So in other words, what God is saying is that I need more of you that are to die as a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. I need more of you to die, as it says in Revelation 6, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So in other words, I need more martyrs. And so you'd have to ask the question, okay, God needs more martyrs. What's the plan? Because there has to be a plan. God does not do anything arbitrary. Uh, the other thing is, is that this passage introduces an expectation that some justice is going to be administered by God on their behalf, but they need to wait until there's more martyrs. And once we get the, once we get the fullness uh, of, of the amount, of the number of martyrs, then something is going to happen that will, uh, uh, that will uh, appease their cry for vengeance their deaths to be avenged. Okay, so take that thought, and now we're going to go to the seven letters of, to the churches. And there's two verses in particular. Chapter 2, verse 26, where Jesus Christ says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give the authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, I'm going to take my authority given to me, and I'm going to exercise my authority and give it to you, to the one who conquers, to the overcomer. It's all the same word in Greek. Okay, in chapter 3, verse 21, he says to another church, the one who conquers or he who overcomes what happens? I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. And I also, as I also conquered. So in other words, he's saying, if you conquer or if you're an overcomer the way I conquered and the way I overcome, well, how did Jesus Christ overcome? He gave himself up to the cross to be executed as an atonement for sin. And so basically he's saying to the one who conquers, who is martyred for my sake, um, uh, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So then there's an expectation that the one who overcomes will be given authority to rule over nations, will be granted the right to sit with Christ on his throne. How do they conquer? Well, we know that answer. Uh, it's spelled out in Revelation 12, verse 11. And they conquered by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. They were put in situations where they had to make a choice. Obey and worship the Antichrist or obey God and be killed. And they chose, I choose to obey God rather than man. So now taking those thoughts and those, those ideas, then we go back to uh, chapter 20, verse 4. And then it's like, well, which one is correct? So we'll read the NIV version again. 
I saw the thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls, those who have not resurrected yet, um, of those who had been beheaded. So that's the martyrs. In particular, the martyrs, the souls that we saw at the breaking of the fifth seal under the altar because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. And that, that just fits that perfectly. They, they being the martyrs, um, had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. That's the reason why they're martyred. That's the reason why they were beheaded. That's the reason why they were killed. They came to life. So what does that mean? Well, they came to life. They were souls, disembodied saints, or disembodied martyrs. Now they came to life, so there's a resurrection involved here, and reign with Christ a thousand years. And then this parenthetical statement, the rest of the dead, they did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. But this is the first resurrection. So there's a little bit of... Um, Lack of clarity, shall we say. Now let's go back and look at the NASB, which is very similar to the ESV. Um, and the NASB says, Then I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Okay, so he saw thrones, saw people on them, and judgment, the authority to judge was given to them. And I saw the souls, those who have not resurrected yet, of those who have been beheaded, the martyrs, because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and, and those, so as well as those, which would be another separate group, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ. So in other words, you got two groups in particular coming to life those that were beheaded and those that did not take the mark of the beast and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, so who are the rest of the dead? Does that include the saints? Um, or is it only those that um, are non-unbelievers? It doesn't really say. It says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were complete and just states this is the first resurrection. So, in all that, let's just conclude, God is in control. Um, but we're going to dig a little deeper into all this. Okay, concerning the authority to judge. Okay, uh, let me just first pick up about halfway into this passage. They came to life. They reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life till the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. And then John says, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Well, the first resurrection, the way I read this here is after the thousand years. And then he says, over such the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So we got a couple of questions. Uh, who has the authority to judge? Who's going to reign with him? So concerning the authority to judge, because if we're having problems understanding this, we need to look at other scripture and see where it all lines up. The words of Jesus, Luke 22, verse 28. You are those who, who have stayed with me in my trials. Now he's talking to the disciples. And I assign to you, as my father signed to me, a kingdom. I assign to you, my disciples, a kingdom. That's a heavy, heavy statement. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Okay, so now I assign you a kingdom, and now we're talking about you're going to be able to eat and drink at my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's like, okay. 
Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, says this. Or do you not know? Now he's just talking to the Gentile saints, uh, the church. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels and how much more than matters pertaining to this life? So it seems to me like there's a heavy responsibility. Uh, is it given to the disciples literally or is Jesus talking about the church? Most definitely Paul is talking to the church. The saints will judge the world. The world is going to be judged by the saints, uh, or at least act as judge, judges, maybe more like on a day-to-day -day type of affairs. But also, we're to judge angels. Wow. Okay, so let's move on. Because then there's also uh, who has the authority to reign. So we got authority to judge, and we got authority to reign. 2 Timothy 2.11 Paul says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, so in other words, if we persevere, if we stand up to the tribulation, we will also reign with him. However, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Okay, so take those thoughts, and then let's go to the words of Jesus back to the seven churches. Uh, we read this once, but we'll read it again. The one who conquers, who's the overcomer, and keeps my works until the end, who perseveres, to him I will give the authority over the nations. The authority. Well, that's rule, reign, judge. And he clarifies even further, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Whoa. And then to the other, another church, he says, the one who conquers, who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So once again, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne. That's ruling. That's reigning. Uh, let's go to chapter 5. Uh, this is when uh, the scroll had been handed to the Lamb. And what? The heavenly host. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, Lord Jesus, to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they, they, they shall reign on the earth. Okay, well, that seems pretty clear. And with that, I'm just going to read on. But hopefully you've noted uh, what the differences are. Um, and choose, uh, ultimately, in the end, um, we're going to be handed over a kingdom. And some of the details in here are nothing more than that. Verse 5. The rest of the dead, okay? So what's the rest of the dead? Did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Okay, and we're told this is the first resurrection, not the second. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection, and over such, the second death, not resurrection, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So wait a minute. I think there's only 1,000 years here. Uh, but uh, this is something that uh, um, we, we got to, uh, I guess, hash out and come to a conclusion. First and foremost, there are two resurrections, okay? Uh, now, 
there are two resurrections, the first one to eternal life in God's kingdom and the second one to eternal punishment. But what we're not seeing is there's two resurrections. Are they a thousand years apart? It does not say that. All it says is there's two resurrections. Okay. So let's go back to the Old Testament, to, to, the, uh, to Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 1. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. That's very important. And many of those, so not all, but many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, they shall awake. And then it says, well, some to everlasting life and some to shame and, and everlasting contempt. Okay. Doesn't really differentiate much here other than there's two paths. Uh, but also stop and think, uh, Daniel, I mean, he's, he's looking, uh, what, like 3,000 years down the road. John 5, from Jesus Christ. And come out, those who have done good, so come out, resurrect. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, to the resurrection of judgment. So it's like, well, Jesus here is talking and like uh, it's all happening at the same time. But those who have done good, uh, they're going to be the sheep. There's going to be the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, well, they're going to be the goats and they're going to go to the resurrection of judgment. Okay, let's listen to Paul. Paul says, having a hope in God, which these men themselves except that there will be a resurrection. Not two resurrections. A resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Huh. Now let's go to Revelation 21, the next chapter where uh, 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 there's a summary of what all has happened. And 21 verse 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So we're not talking about a second resurrection, but we're talking about a resurrection, and life or a second death. Okay, now I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because this is, chapter 15 is so important in, in eschatology, in time events. And this is what Paul has to say concerning death and resurrection. Verse 20, But in fact, Christ, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death. So that would be Adam. By a man, the son of man, God incarnate, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in also in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay. But each in his own order. All right, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming, the word coming here is parousia, and we know what that word means. Uh, so at his parousia, those who belong to Christ, okay? Those who belong to Christ, that sounds like we're talking about his bride, right? The saints. Then comes to the end. Okay, well, when does the end come? Well, after the thousand years, right? So, so uh, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming, the parousia, those who belong to Christ, and then comes the end after the thousand years, when he delivers the kingdom, the gospel message to God the Father after what? He destroys every rule and every authority and every power. 
So he's destroying and judging the non-believers and the spiritual powers, which we're going to read about. For he must reign. So Jesus Christ must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet, which we interpret as a thousand years. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay. And so with that in mind, we will read verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Okay, and so I'm going to pick up here on part two of this video.